Welcome to Marshall Mississippi Zoom Tour. I'm Marshall Ramsey, editor at large at Mississippi Today. We like to have great conversations with different Mississippians about things that are going on in the world and of course, a little bit about them too. And I'm very, very happy today. I have somebody that I've had a chance to be able to uh, be on panels with and talk to in the past. He's, he's just a, a, a very fascinating guy, Dr. Luke Lampton from Magnolia. I'll just read a little bit about him for you here. He's on the Mississippi State Board of Health since 2006. Uh, served as the chair from 2007 to 2017 as well. He also edits the Journal of the Mississippi State Medical Association. He's a past president of the Mississippi Academy of Family Physicians, the past president of the South Central Medical Society. And of course, he graduated for UMMC in 1993. We're here to talk about a couple of things today with you today, Dr. Lampton or Luke, I guess I can call you Luke. I always feel I mean, like I, I never refer to my doctors by the first name, but I'll refer to you. Uh, of course, Luke, it's always good to talk to you. And it's funny when um, the Zoom started up, it said Luke has entered the room. And I thought about the the end scene of the Mandalorian when Luke Skywalker comes in. And I'm just thinking that's really cool. And I hope I didn't give away too many spoilers. Luke, I hope you're doing well. I know you had COVID and I'm glad to hear that you're doing better. I am. And I and I and my day job is, is I'm a family physician practicing in Magnolia. And I have a clinic. I go, I have a a large nursing home practice. I have a hospital practice. I have, uh, I'm the physician at a Jerry psych unit. And I'm also, uh, uh, I have a lot of other hats in, in the area, but in all of those situations, I interact with, with nurses and I'm a, a, a big advocate for, uh, for nurses and their, uh, essential role in quality healthcare. Yeah. I've, I've, um, emceed the, the Nightingale award several times and I always tell the story about when my mom had cancer when I was a kid and the nurse would let me in, even though I was too young and it was after hours to be able to see. And I've always felt like nurses held the keys to the kingdom were incredibly important. And I, I guess it's important for us to set that up considering there's a piece of legislation that has come out and you're kind of here to talk about that a little bit. It's House Bill 1303 that's come out that basically allows nurse practitioners and physician assistants to be able to kind of operate on their own and not necessarily under the supervision of a physician. And you're here, of course, under the position that physicians should still have some degree of oversight, correct? Uh, correct. And uh, I'm, I'm on the faculty at, at multiple uh, uh, nursing schools to, and I teach nurse practitioners. I've taught uh, dozens of them and I've taught, uh, I'm on the faculty I teach medical students and I'm also on the physician assistant school. And I currently have a student from the uh, physician assistant school um, working with me right now. And uh, um, the, uh, what, what my, my point is, and, and when I started practice in Magnolia in, 19, in the early 1990s, my idea of what a medical practice was, was a physician going to a clinic and seeing those patients and then maybe going to the hospital and going to a nursing home. Um, the evolution of what medical practice is has evolved over the last 20 years into uh, a medical team model and it's a physician led medical team. And that's where my practice has evolved. And I think the physician led medical team uh, provides the highest quality of care for rural citizens and every citizen in the state um, and in the country. And I think we need to be, as, uh, as leaders and, and our legislature, we need to be looking at ways to improve the medical team, the physician-led medical team, but also embrace that. And if you look at medical schools, medical schools will tell you right now, they're teaching medical students to be um, uh, part of the physician-led medical team. So if we really go away and say, well, let's break up the team and each team member isn't important. Um, and, you know, um, you know, it would be like separating a, um, a, a lawyer and a paralegal and together they're providing uh, quality legal services for the community, but both of them don't function as well separately. Um, as a physician, uh, and as a faculty member at my at nurse, I'm on the faculty of, uh, uh, of multiple nurse practitioner schools. And, uh, and when I teach them, uh, I train them. I would think like other faculty would not to stand alone, but to work in collaboration with physicians. And I would say the majority of nurse practitioners are 
are trained to work uh, in collaboration with physicians. Uh, Monday morning when I got up, I had about five texts and I oversee, I have a, an, an outstanding nurse practitioner in my clinic. Uh, I oversee a rural clinic that's next door to my clinic and there are two nurse practitioners that I oversee. Um, and, uh, and I have a nursing home practice where I oversee nurse practitioners and a PA. And uh, I had five uh, uh, texts from them that involved patient care. And those texts would constitute, uh, I have this patient, they're having this, they're on this medicine. This is the problem, what do you think we should do? Um, uh, a physician is leading it, but he's able to extend himself and also the quality work done with nurse practitioners that he can collaborate with. And, you know, I, I look at my nursing homes. The problem is if we separate the medical team and, and, and make nurse practitioners independent and separate, corporate medicine is going to place them in settings where they have no physician backup and they have no physician collaborative or consultation services. And, um, and I would rather, uh, go to an emergency room where if you see a nurse practitioner, you have a physician who is available to them if there is a situation which shows complexity and also is overseeing the work that they do. And the oversight and the collaboration is, is not extensive. I think uh, I usually review 10% of the charts of a, of a nurse practitioner that they see and I'm available uh, with complex patients to discuss the quality of care. My PA calls me about every other day uh, from the nursing home and he says, Dr. Lampton, I just want to pick your brain about this patient. Um, I find that extraordinarily helpful in the quality of care that we're giving uh, to our patients that we take care of as a team. We're a team. And, uh, and it's not that the physician displaces the nurse practitioner or the PA in these settings, but they each provide an essential role in the medical team. The first day I have my patients with uh, Whenever I have a student, a nurse practitioner student or a medical student, um, I, I go over a Latin phrase that is primum non nocere, primum non nocere, which is first do no harm. And I tell them that medicine can be, uh, there's a lot of power to do good in medicine, but there's also a lot of power to do bad and make mistakes. And the unfortunate aspect of medicine is if a physician or a nurse practitioner or a PA makes a mistake, they hurt the patient. And so there's a central aspect to uh, quality of care that we need to uh, uh, have the medical team working where that quality is higher. And I think uh, primum non nocere, first do no harm, is, uh, can best be accomplished through an effective physician-led medical team. I'm gonna link uh, the video from Donnie Scoggins, who's representative and he's also a nurse practitioner and he's one of the, the supporters of the bill. I'm gonna link a video to him talk a little bit about it why he thinks it's important. So I just wanted to make sure he got his side of this also. But I was trying to think about what's driving this and, and I went back and looked at some of the other states that have that have passed this kind of legislation. And of course, North Dakota was the first state. I think we're Florida and California last year. There's 12 others, I believe, total. But 22 states have a scope of practice law, and I guess I assume we do here in Mississippi a little bit. Well, what's driving it now? I mean, what caused him to bring that bill out? And what is what is do you think is driving? I mean, obviously, you said that in the last 20 years, the business has changed a lot. And really, honestly, I don't recall a reaction from the doctor community quite as strong as since maybe telemedicine, which is another change, obviously. Is it COVID that's driving it right now? Why now? I don't quite understand this. Well, it's, it's, been a na it's on the national agenda for uh, the Nurse Practitioner Association at a national level. Mm -hmm. uh, my nurse practitioners and friends that I interact with, it's not on their agenda. In Mississippi, 85% of the nurse practitioners work in, the, in a clinic uh, my nurse practitioners either are working as my employee or work in my clinic or work in a clinic that's hospital owned. Uh, there is some discussion that the, the, the fee that's involved in a collaborative relationship 
is one of the issues that uh, um, is pushing this in Mississippi. I don't buy that. 85% of nurse practitioners uh, work in clinics and hospitals and for their physician. And I wouldn't, I'm not charging myself a physician oversight fee to, to take care of my patients. In fact, uh, of the uh, six nurse practitioners that I have a relationship with, I charge no fee. I receive no uh, collaboration fee whatsoever for any of the collaboration I do. And I would think that most of the, the nurse practitioners that work in a hospital for a clinic or a hospital pay no fee at all. So uh, that you would be talking about the independent providers of nurse practitioners. Uh, and often they're the ones that are most in need of collaboration. Oftentimes, if you're in the clinic and you're working, you're caring for the patients and you have that collaboration uh, by nature of working together, um, but it's the independent ones that uh, are sometimes doing Botox injections that are sometimes getting out range of their scope that frankly, they need that oversight. Uh, uh, author Conan Doyle, who, who was the author for Sherlock Holmes, when he graduated from medical school, he was a physician. He graduated from medical school in 1881 and he wrote his uh, mother a letter. And in it, he wrote at the top, I've received my diploma today. And at the bottom, he said, a license to kill, a license to kill. And uh, I'm not bad talking medicine, but uh, there is a reason that we put physicians, that we make them go uh, to four years of medical school and then, then a minimum of three, uh, to, to seven or nine years of postgraduate uh, training. Um, if you've read anything uh, about the development of professionals, uh, there's a book that everyone should read and it's called uh, Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell. And he looks at the training of physicians and the training of healthcare workers and he looks at the training of pilots. And what he concluded was that no matter if a pilot went to Harvard or Southwest Mississippi Community College, uh, they would have, it really wasn't their educational aspect, it was the time that they spent flying. And what he found was that crashes would happen with a Harvard trained pilot if they didn't have 10,000 hours of training. And he said that really what makes a professional competent is time and hours. And he said in lots of hours, and he, he says, if you wanna be safe as a pilot, you need to have flown 10,000 flight hours. And he said that time does give a, somebody who may have gone to a lesser school if they got the basic skills, extraordinary competence, but it's a lot of time. And that's one thing I don't think that's appreciated by the general public is that they see their physician and they don't realize the hours and years that they've spent focused on trying not to kill them with positive medical care. Uh, if, if you think about what a physician does, I have patients on blood thinners. I have patients that bleed out from blood thinners. There's a lot of, of weighing pro and con. It's so much of what a physician and a nurse practitioner in collaboration with a physician and a PA does that could result in extraordinary harm. Um, the, the first aphorism, one more Latin phrase I teach my medical students is the first aphorism of Hippocrates is ars longa vitae brevis. And what it means is uh, life is short and the art long. And what Hippocrates was saying, who was the father of medicine was that it takes a long time to learn the art of medicine, which is the art of medicine. You'll hear physicians talk about it, but it's the application of your knowledge and your training to each individual patient, which each individual patient is different. Uh, and you've got to apply it often in a different way. I can't treat you the same way I treat your sister or your mother. Each one requires me to think about the harm that could occur if I do treat you and what negative things could occur um, if I do something that um, uh, places you in danger as far as medical treatment. Um, or even surgery. I mean, things like referring somebody for surgery, you'll hear down in where I am, I try not to refer anybody to surgery. Why? Because it usually introduces chaos, decline, and problems. Uh, however, if, it's, if somebody has a condition that their life is in danger or their quality of life is threatened, 
you, you weigh that and you say, well, maybe this patient will benefit from surgery. But there needs to be in medicine extraordinary caution. And, and I think that first do no harm really comes from time. And Malcolm Gladwell would say, uh, you know, I tell my patients, my students, they have to see 10,000 patients before they're going to get competent instead of 10,000 hours. And they've got a long way to go. Most of the nurse practitioners that I train in my clinic are about at the level of a third year medical student, uh, which is not, a, not, I'm not, that's not detrimental comment. I'm just making the fact, and I train third year and fourth year medical students and nurse practitioners and uh, uh, nurse practitioner training occurs in a variety of, of most of their training is in online programs. Uh, most of the students I get are from a program called Walden and it's online and, and they basically show up at an office and the quality of, of the training varies from teacher to teacher. And I like to think I give very good quality to my students and when they graduate, uh, they're extraordinarily competent, but I've had nurse practitioners that I know that have been hired after they get their nurse practitioner degree and their DEA who have never written a prescription physically. Um, so there can be holes in the training, massive holes. And in fact, I have found that some of the online students are better than some of the ones that come from the University Medical Center and uh, South Alabama, which I usually sends me some students and I've had some come from LSU. Um, why, I don't know, but I think most of those that are getting the online training are, are experienced nurses who've worked in an emergency room setting or have a lot, a lot of training. And, uh, and I've seen extraordinary quality uh, nurse practitioners um, develop from an online program, which seems you know, counterintuitive. And I've had students come from the University Medical Center as nurse practitioners, and when they get through, they can't tie their shoelaces. Uh, Repre the Repre quality Repre is very variable. Yeah. And I think that with medicine, there seems to be more, you may have somebody with a personality disorder or some kind of psychiatric issue, but usually you, you end up with a quality product because why? They've gone through four years of medical training, uh, training and then they've gone through three to nine years of training after that and hopefully any of the uh, those with uh, with problems interacting with people have been weeded out let me in his explanation of the bill uh representative uh scoggins talks about how there will be a 3600 hours of transition to practice the two full years uh, basically, you work with the physician for those two years before you get there. You have so basically, they're saying between that and their training, they'd end up with a similar about five thousand hours, which would be similar to physician training. And that was his explanation of it. Um, and what you've said, obviously, there is. Do you think it's, that's it's, it's, that's that's not enough? And and I and I do think that the issue is they are trained to collaborate and consult with the physician. So. Uh, you know, how long does a paralegal need to work with a lawyer before you give them a law degree? Um, it's uh, uh, the amount of, of time uh, is uh, 3,600 hours is, is not that uh, much in the grand scheme of a medical, medical training. It's also not well documented and uh, uh, nurse practitioner training is usually they show up for work and then after two weeks you sign a form that says they've been there this many hours. That's not extraordinarily verified and and as I said the quality of the nursing it all depends on what they've done. Yeah. Uh, but but I think my PA has been a PA for 20 years. 20 years. I think he still benefits from consulting me. Now does he consult me with 90%, he consults me with 10% of his issues or less. But those issues are still very important and it allows him to treat complex, complicated care, which in rural areas, you're gonna see it. You're gonna see people with five conditions uh, and you need to know what, how does their diabetes interact with their heart failure. And it, um, the complexity of a lot of these patients, I think is, is uh, unappreciated. And when I talk to most of my nurse practitioners, they appreciate the collaboration and there is, it would not continue if it was not required. 
I do not see. And in fact, the doctors, if they weren't required to be uh, consulting or collaborative with the nurses, probably wouldn't put up with having a, somebody ask them all the time all these questions. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. what you're doing is this bill is going to end up disrupting the medical team and prevent this positive interaction between nurse practitioners and PAs and physicians, which is going to result in the best care. You know, the question I have is, why do you want to disrupt the medical team? What are the problems with the medical team? Why do you need this? If 85% of these nurse practitioners are working with their physicians and aren't complaining, what is the point of independent practice when the quality of care, you, you, you know, I would think most patients would like to have if they see a nurse practitioner that, they, that a physician is reviewing what they're doing. And in fact, they should have a lot more confidence in what the nurse practitioner does, feeling that they're interacting with the physician. Um, so I think the medical team needs to be supported and figure out what is the purpose of this legislation. It's certainly not quality patient care. It's not quality patient care. It's not, it's not uh, protect the patient because the medical team where they work, physicians and nurse practitioners work together is the team. Is there a problem with how some physicians interact with their nurse practitioners or who they collaborate with? If that's the issue, ad let's address that. And I think the biggest reason they've said is the collaboration fee well, if you get out there, most of the nurse practitioner I'm talking with don't even pay a collaboration fee. And if there's some thought that it's too much, they should put a cap on it or, or figure out a way. But most of the, uh, uh, my brother oversees a nurse practitioner and he doesn't charge her a fee. Um, um, and so there's a lot of, uh, that's misrepresented. And, if, you know, and I don't know of any employed nurse practitioner who pays a fee for the physician to oversee them. Now the hospital may, may, as part of the salary for the physician say, you're going to oversee this and collaborate with this nurse practitioner, but it's not taken from the nurse practitioner at all. And, and the problem would be is instead of utilizing the medical team in rural areas, uh, such as in emergency rooms and in hospitals, then the hospitals are gonna go to the the, the cheapest thing, which is let's get rid of the physician and let's just have a, a nurse practitioner and run in the hospitals. And there are emergency rooms in Mississippi run by nurse practitioners right now. And, uh, and, um, and I've had nurse practitioner friends who say, well, I don't want to go over there because I'm worried about, I've never intubated anybody. I've never worked in an emergency room and they're going to hire them to run the emergency room and work in the emergency room. Um, you know, my, my point is physicians are bad enough. Physicians with our extraordinary amount of training and years of training make mistakes, a lot more mistakes than we should. Uh, there's, um, and to dumb that down uh, is gonna impact physician care. Um, and by saying dumb down, I don't mean, I mean reduce the requirements for quality medical care given. But I think we need to, uh, really support the medical team. Um, well, Luke, you touched on something there. You talked about, you said that you were worried that some hospitals would reduce the number of doctors and put in PAs and, and, and nurse practitioners in their place. So you feel like there's an economic concern. And, you know, some people might even claim this is y'all for trying to protect your turf. But like you said, it's, it's about you worrying about quality of care, correct? Well, that's my point. And in fact, my clinic... When I came down to my clinic in 1993, I never envisioned a nurse practitioner working at my clinic. We were three physicians. I've lost all of those physicians. I'm the only physician in my clinic and I have two nurse practitioners working there. And I think that's an extraordinarily effective model. And that's gonna be the model in rural areas. Right. But I don't, the model would not be as strong without me there it, it, with just two nurse practitioners. It would be, it's, it's extraordinarily high quality with me and two nurse practitioners. And my nurse practitioner, I have probably one of the most uh, intelligent and talented and gifted nurse practitioners. Uh, and and she, if a patient gets complicated, she says, you need to see Dr. Lampton. And, and they see me and we work together. And usually it's talking with the nurse practitioner, trying to figure out a plan of care that'll work for this patient. Um, patients get extraordinarily complicated. And in, in rural areas, I'm not sure the general public understands how much stress and strain physicians and nurse practitioners and PAs have trying to care for these patients because oftentimes you can't refer them into a specialist. 
or they won't go to a specialist. I have people that walk to my, my clinic mm-hmm. and have no transportation. Uh, it's, uh, it's hard out there on the front line in rural Mississippi. And I think we need to encourage the medical team approach. And they have, uh, in the last few years, uh, the uh, legislature and the board of medical licensure and the nursing board have liberalized the oversight rules where physicians can, overs- can oversee a large number of nurse practitioners. There's no, so as far as a nurse practitioner finding someone to collaborate with, that's relatively easy. They've removed in primary care any mileage so if a nurse practitioner has an independent clinic in, uh, in Gulfport, they could have a physician in Hernando providing them oversight. I mean, that's yeah. a lot of leeway with this. And uh, I about to so, say with the, with the pandemic, and I know, you know, I've done telemedicine visits now with my doctors and so forth because of it. But I mean, talk about the change in the last 365 days to the medical profession, because it's totally different now than it was even two to three years ago. It's because everything's changed and I don't see a lot of it changing back. It's, it seems to be, you know, like to quote my friend who's a cardiologist, he said, my, my patients that live in the Delta, for instance, like being able to touch base with me via phone. So do you feel like obviously PAs and, and nurse practitioners are gonna play a very important role in the changing, because with the doctor shortage and everything else, but with the pandemic, talk about how this is, this is totally gonna change healthcare. Well, and I think when you, when, when you just brought it with our physician numbers and there's, we're, we're doing all these efforts to try to get more physicians in rural areas, but we still have the lowest per capita number of physicians yeah. in, in the country. And so nurse practitioner and the PA, the medical team is the way to provide medical care and the best use of those physicians. We need to be training those physicians to, uh, to be overseeing nurse practitioners and they, their model needs to be, I'm gonna go to a clinic and I'm going to have two or three nurse practitioners that I'm going to be uh, collaborating with, and we're going to take care of a large population, and I'm going to figure out ways to provide quality care. In mentioning how, how my practice has changed, my rural practice in Magnolia, since COVID came, we have a drive through in, in the back parking lot, and the patients do not want to give that up. It's amazing how they do appreciate that because of the speed. If they if there's not much going on, they just need a refill of their medicines. They come through the drive through and we get them to, we check their blood pressure and they need blood work, they come out front. But there's probably 50% of my practice is done outside right now. Now, how is that gonna change? I would think that, that that'll decrease over time, but right now, until the uh, pandemic is better controlled, patients have a sense of comfort out there. You mentioned telemedicine. That's probably another 25% of my practice. So 50% is in a drive-through, 25% is telemedicine. And I do, you know, the the only thing I see with that is corporate medicine and the insurance companies don't like to pay for it. But is that consumer friendly? Yes. Does it provide high quality care? Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, The problem in rural areas like I am is uh, difficulties with uh, internet, Wi-Fi, And often I have to handle a telemedicine visit over the telephone. Now, is that as good as seeing them? No. Is it as good as uh, um, having them in the clinic? No. Does it provide an essential service and can you get the job done? Yes. You know, I wouldn't want to provide all of my care that way, but can you provide a visit? And and in the past, to be quite honest, most physicians and nurse practitioners that you talk to were, were, were providing this service. It's just the insurance company weren't paying them for it, okay? So it is a way for physicians, and and I I do think in the end, uh, we need to pay nurse practitioners and PAs and physicians for what they do, because there's so much uh, uh, that to expect, and it's usually primary care that they expect to do a bunch of stuff unpaid. So I think that's where telemedicine has been good, is that a lot of telemedicine and telehealth services were provided anyway. It's just... Uh, the physicians that were doing it and not getting reimbursed for it. Um, but we can direct it more. And, and I think with my, my interaction and uh, telehealth services, it's much more organized. It's much more focused on things that I need to focus on, such as vital signs. And I often do it with my home health patients. And I have a nurse on the other end, which is a very effective way. And that talks about the medical team. The medical team doesn't have to be nurse practitioners and PAs either. Our medical team involves RNs and LPNs and social workers. 
Uh, and we really need to look at that, that you need a, a team to do it. Um, the other thing at my practice is I have started bringing people in, mask, and we utilize social distancing and spacing, and that's probably about 25%. What do I see? I see probably an evolution where I'll probably continue to do about 25% uh, telehealth. I see the drive-through service cutting back over time once, once we get the pandemic under better control and more people coming back in. I do think patients miss the touch. I've been making nursing home rounds uh, with telemedicine at some of my nursing home. And the last time I made rounds, I had several patients tell me that they loved me, oh. you know, and, and not yeah. romantic. I'm just saying, but no, I understand. Yeah. What I'm telling you is that they're lonely and, yeah. and they appreciate, they were very appreciative that I was even looking at them on an I, you know, an iPad and they were able to see me and I was able to see them and I was talking to them. There's a lot that can be accomplished, especially if you have an established relationship with a patient. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and I encourage, um, you know, that we maintain some of that. And, and, and there's aspects of being on call where telemedicine can be very helpful. I have a lot of nursing home patients. In the past, we'd just be on the phone. I'm trying to visually see them now. Most of the nursing homes have a capability where you can do telehealth and they'll and, and to be able to physically see a patient who's having a problem after hours is actually a way to improve the quality of care. It allows the physician to see them. And, it, and we often can keep a patient from going to the emergency room because we have a better view and have more insight into what's going on. Looking at where we are right now in the pandemic. And as we are talking today, it is February 2nd, 2021. That's where we're talking. The numbers have gone down a little bit since the peak over the holidays from everybody getting together. And the numbers were just catastrophically frightening there for a while. However, the deaths have lagged. I think we had 76 deaths today, so we're still at a high number of deaths. We're gonna get a little bit of a pause. We've got the two, the UK variant, the South African variant that are, is in the United States. Where do you see us going, say over the next six months as the vaccine's rolling out? Cause I know right now it's kind of like finding toilet paper was last year trying to get a vaccine, but it, there's more and more coming into the state. But where are we gonna go? Because I think at the end of the day, if, we, if the hospitals are clogged, I know that causes obviously a spike and not only death from COVID, but death from other problems too. Where do you see us headed? Well, I think most of the, the medical community is seeing the vaccine as the end to the crisis. It's yeah. not the end right now, but it certainly should provide uh, uh, protection for uh, a large number of population and decreased spread. There's yeah. significant concern, I think, in the medical community about viral mutations. And viruses mutate, that's what they do. Uh, right. I mean, at the CDC, everybody has been expecting viruses to mutate. Hopefully they won't mutate in a role and they don't seem to be mutating in a way that the vaccine is still gonna be effective, I think for the majority of the strains and most of what's out there right now. Could right. something develop and we need a different variant? You know, each year they come up with flu vaccines uh, that are based on what they think is the variant that they need to hit. Um, and such thing may eventually evolve with, with COVID. Most of the medical community thinks in three or four years, COVID's gonna be like a cold, okay? It's gonna be much less, uh, you know, deadly yeah. and that we will have protect most of the, of, the, uh, of the citizens with the vaccines. But I think right now what we've got to do is we need to get as many vaccines out there as possible. Um, as far as treatment options, uh, I'm finding uh, exceptional uh, results utilizing monoclonal antibodies. Oh, you may have heard of there's an Eli Lilly uh, monoclonal antibody that everybody refers to as Bam Bam, and that's the one we give. Uh, yeah. The one I got was Regeneron, and uh, uh, so there are two types of monoclonal antibodies, but my symptoms went away within 12 hours of getting the monoclonal antibody. Wow. Uh, it's extraordinarily effective. It's uh, um, um, the, the progress of the vaccines and the progress of the monoclonal antibodies have been impressive. And I do think they're effective. Uh, you know, from a medical standpoint, it's, it's been a little disheartening to see how politics gets into medicine and, and, and the treatment you know, physicians are trying to do the best they can. And of course, with something where with an, 
a virus where there is no treatment, throwing different things at it and seeing what work and what works is probably good medicine. Okay, but it goes back to primum non nocere, do no harm as you attempt to do that. So uh, there's a lot that we've learned. Uh, we may end up, uh, you know, uh, hydrochloroquine, the Plaquenil, you know, people may think originally uh, positive, then negative, and it may end up being positive again. Who knows? But the research is not there, and there's still so much that we need to learn from this virus and how to treat it. But what we do know is the vaccine, you know, the Moderna and the Pfizer and uh, provides in the 90% protection if you get the booster, um, you know, and, and that's impressive, okay? Uh, anecdotally, uh, I have friends that utilize monoclonal antibodies and most of them say they haven't had anybody that got the monoclonal antibodies die from COVID. The problem with the monoclonal antibodies is you've got to give them relatively early in the course. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but I've seen uh, my patients that I've given, I've given 30, 30 doses of it. Not a single one has died of COVID yet. So I'm trying to utilize that more. Why isn't that more available in the general public? I'm not sure there's enough of a supply, okay? Right. Uh, I was uh, able to get some for my uh, hospital. Uh, I know in my area, Brookhaven utilizes it. I don't think Southwest Hospital in Macon has been able to get it. So there's a lot of pockets and holes about being able to get treatment options such as infusions like the monoclonal antibodies. Yeah, that seems to be the big thing about this whole pandemic as a whole has just been supply issues, whether it's PPE or you know drugs or whatever on the case on that. And and I'm looking back on the 1918 pandemic, which obviously this is a different beast, but then again, it's also had the, very similar. A lot of people in 1918 had the flu, but they didn't have the, the storm in their lungs and they didn't die. But then that big percentage of people did. But it totally changed how medicine, changed, changed medicine as a whole in that period. You know, I mean, masks became a thing back then and it changed how that, like I said, probably between the technology on the on the on the vaccines i mean that's going to be taken to other areas and other vaccines as well don't you think in 5 years we're going to be a totally different medical society than we were even before this that was a really yes. clunky question yeah. sorry about that well but i do think that that technology has moved into even rural areas yeah. uh, and i think i think there's going to be much more focus and a much more of an expectation and i think there's going to be a lot less resistance from the medical boards and, and, and insurance companies about trying to be a lot more consumer friendly in providing medical care. Yeah. I do think that telehealth is here to stay. Uh, I do think telehealth is best in an established relationship with somebody who's actually seen you before. And, and not that you, you could get set up like this, but I do think that the patient physician and the nurse practitioner uh, patient relationship needs to be worked on and developed if this is how we interact. But I see this is here to stay. And I hope the other thing is a better appreciation of public health. I think we've seen our uh, Mississippi's Department of Health under Dr. Dobbs has performed exceptionally well, has Very been well. extremely <laughs> honest with the public, has done the best it can in, in the political situation, uh, has maximized, I think, the, the health of the citizens in the best way it can with very limited supplies. Uh, I think they are all focused on getting the vaccine out there as quickly as possible. I think as a state, we've done very well um, with, with our Department of Health response. And our Department of Health is uh, one of the lowest funded per capita in the United States. And I would like to think that in the end, our legislature uh, would focus on, and I wish they were focusing on, beside uh, disrupting the medical team model, the physician-led medical team, and, and giving independence uh, to nurse practitioners and eliminating uh, collaboration, I'd like them to have a bill that spends more money and tries to really strengthen the Department of Health. Uh, let's, instead of being the, uh, uh, the department that has the lowest per capita funding, uh, why don't we try to boost that up? We're improving teacher salaries where we won't be on the bottom. Why are we content 
to have a, a health department that we spend the least on of any state in the United States per capita. Alabama spends twice what we spend. Every contiguous state puts more in their health departments. Southern states do. Why, why are we uh, underfunding public health? And I would like to think there would be an appreciation for the work of people like Dr. Dobbs and, and, and Dr. Paul Byers and uh, Jim Craig and some of these heroes at the Department of Health uh, and try to give them not only funding where they can provide quality care, but also uh, enough staff to get the job done where they're not performing secretarial services and they're actually utilizing their, uh, their ex extraordinary skills as public health leaders. Oh, no, that would be good. Yeah. That's and and the other thing is yeah. too, is, is, is from a nursing standpoint, as somebody who is very pro-nursing, RNs and LPNs in this state are suffering. They are being yeah. placed in settings. If you talk to RNs and LPNs, uh, the uh, Mississippi's Nursing Association needs to be getting the legislature to do something about uh, how they put one nurse in charge of 300 patients at a nursing home, okay? And how that's okay. And some of the nursing matrixes, you know, there used to be, uh, they used to call hospitals, uh, in the first hospitals in Paris were called the Hotel Du, and it was called the House of God. And the reason it was called the House of God was largely nursing care, as you'd have a physician, but you would have nurses that would provide hands-on care uh, for these patients. And that's what a lot of these patients, especially geriatric patients needs. You go into a nursing home right now and you can't find a nurse, but, you know, because of the ratios have been. And the one nurse that's there is underpaid and overworked. And, and at the hospitals I work at, at, at the nursing homes I work at, if you have a nurse miss a, miss a shift, there is a, there's extraordinary, uh, they're overwhelmed with work. They're unable to care for the patients. You know, what we, the issue for nurses in this state is that they're not paid enough. Why don't we pay RNs and LPNs more? We're focused on this, the highest paid percentage of nurse practitioners, uh, which is the highest paid percentage of nurses. The overwhelming majority of nurses out there are underpaid RNs and LPNs uh, that don't have adequate help, are required to see patients during this epidemic, often without appropriate PPE. Um, that's the issue for nurses. You know, independent practice is not going to help the nurses of the state. What's going to help the nurses of the state is let's work on these nurse ratios. Let's try to improve how much an RN makes and how much an LPN makes. Because, you know, in the delivery of care in the hospital, the doctor is important. He makes his round and the nurse practitioner is important. They make a round. Who's caring for that patient? Who makes it a hotel due, a house of God, is the nurse that's putting their hands on the patient, starting the IV caring for that patient and 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 we as a state don't care at all about those nurses and they're the front line and i'd like to see some some bill that that raises their salary you know and looks at looks at uh, their work ratios and why we would make them uh, oversee hundreds of patients you know oh well oh well luke Thanks for taking all the time to talk to me today and, and, and talk about this issue a little bit. And obviously, I, I mean, I hope you continue to stay well. And um, I really, really do appreciate you, you taking the time. It's, it's always a pleasure to see you and talk to you. And I enjoy the work you do at Mississippi today. You need a well, raise you. for your cartoon work. I, that's where I go. And they're more than, uh, uh, you're the main one I wanna see when I push uh, my app for Mississippi today. Well, I appreciate that. Uh, today's cartoon, I had Dr. Dobbs uh, doing the Bill Murray thing on Groundhog Day with the pandemic, you know, <laughs> the alarm clock hitting six o'clock. And you know, he has to feel that way. I asked him when I interviewed him, I said, do you scream in your pillow at night? Because I know <laughs> it's incredibly how frustrated he must be, but he has done a fantastic job, like you said. And um, I can't think of a better person for that job at that time, especially considering his background and everything. I think we, we got quite fortunate when we got him. I think we were exceptionally fortunate, and, and, I, uh, and he and he leads with with uh, uh, with just extraordinary vigor and vitality. And he also he cares about the people he works with. Uh, you know his his peers that work with him respect him and admire him. Uh, he's just a good guy. Yeah, and he's got a good good sense of humor when it comes to ending up in my cartoons too. I got to give him some credit on that. Yeah. Hey, throw out your book title one more time. I totally blanked out. It's fantastic. I sat on a book panel with Images in, in, in Mississippi Medicine, 
a photographic yeah. history of, of medicine in Mississippi. It's wonderful. Uh, it's available at Lemuria yeah. uh, and at the State Medical Association. But for, for most of our listeners uh, or your listeners, they're, they're Lemuria uh, keeps it. And uh, uh, it yeah. was a lot of fun. And it's, it's a photographic look at the state, uh, but it also looks at the history of medicine, uh, which is a fascinating story that, that most people don't know about. And yeah. it's also, I tried to hit most of the regions in, in the state too. So I think anyone at any who has an interest in healthcare in Mississippi would find it of interest. Yeah, it's fantastic. It really is good. Well, I'll let you go, but thank you so much. And, and we'll talk again soon. Thank you. Good to see you. Thanks, Luke. I appreciate it. All right. Bye-bye.